Hello and welcome. Tonight we have Alice Fraser. She's one of the top stand-up comedians currently based out of London. And very fortunately, she's touring Australia at the moment. Alice is not only a stand-up comedian, she's also a poet and a lawyer. So a very interesting person. So Alice, I think with those three things being the poet, the lawyer, the stand-up comedian, they're obviously all united perhaps in a way that people wouldn't know, which is someone with a great command of language and communication. But I think all three of those vocations require someone to look very carefully at what the truth of a matter is. You can't write poetry, you can't state a claim in a case, and you can't make people laugh unless you're saying something that's truthful. So what do you think it is, and where did it start in your life where you could see through the mist and see, wow, that's what's really happening? I think it was a combination of things. I was brought up uh, in a Buddhist household in the 80s, back at a time when that was not very common, sort of mindfulness and all of that Buddhist stuff is in the mainstream now, but when I was young, I was the odd kid out. So as an outsider, you see the world in a slightly different way. Also, my mum was sick, she had MS, um, and so that sort of brings you very much down to earth. It made a lot of the things that people my age were worried about seem pretty irrelevant. And so I was interested in the way that people would lie to themselves or the distance between what people believed and the truth. And then I became really fascinated by how you get an idea from your head into someone else's head, that communication thing. How do you explain something? How do you articulate something? How do you communicate something that is, you know, it's, it's like you don't cry when you watch the news, even though it's tragic. So how do you convey the, the meaning of an emotion like tragedy or anything really? It's clearly not just telling the facts. There has to be something else to it. And that's why I kind of diversified my talking portfolio, as it were. So it's an interesting thing between having real issues to deal with a teenager as a teenager, mm. instead of just worrying about what eyeshadow to use or to the uh, underage disco and at the other time being intrigued about how to communicate well, which yeah. is a, a real skill there. Yeah, how do you explain not just uh, the, the facts of something, but the meaning of something? Yeah. And, I, and I guess it's interesting there talking about how do you communicate well? How do you communicate well? How do you stand in front of 500 people at a, at a stand-up comedy gig or you know, when you're writing poetry, which might be read by 50,000 people or whatever, or communicating to 50 people in a court, how do you grab those people and hold their attention and then change their mind? Well, there's a whole bunch of different techniques that you use, obviously. Pace, rhythm, the way that I think of like an hour-long show, you have a, an, a story arc and then you also have a, like a, a balance of intensity. So you might be saying something very personally, uh, very personal to you, very detailed to you, but you might say that loudly or quietly or very close or very intensely or as though it were a throwaway remark. All of those things and balancing all those things out, depending on the audience as well, it has to depend on who's in the room at the time and how they're reacting. So if I'm doing a gig out in rural New South Wales where this accent will make them think, well, who does she think she is? I have to be a bit more self-deprecating. I have to tell some jokes that are going to make me look like an idiot so they don't feel like I've come to lecture them. And vice versa, if I'm doing, as I did the other day, I emceed a gig for the Cambridge-Oxford boat race, I had to put up my intellectual credentials so that they thought I was worth listening to. So it just depends on the room, it de depends on the vibe, it depends on what you're trying to say. It's about reading the people. I mean, I think everyone does that on a, on a level when we meet up with people anyway, you know, whether you're talking to tradies or, you know, it's how we get things done. But I find it interesting that you're doing it on, that, you know, on a professional level, like you're reading your crowd, you're reading your audience. Yeah, you know? every, everyone will do that to a different extent. Like if you're talking to your family or somebody who you're very close to, you might not have to say very much at all to communicate a lot. You know, it'll just be in your expression or your proximity or you can just give them a hug and it can mean a lot. So I think that's one of the most important things about communication is knowing who's in the room with you. That, that room one's interesting. And before we actually started chatting today, sitting next to you here, Marty Hankin. He, uh, <laughs> Marty's <laughs> one of our regulars on the show and a co-host as well. But Marty also does what you would do, which is travelling around in, in different areas. Marty's been a race car driver, as, amongst other things. Marty, how do you find when you actually have to deal with different groups of people, 
And you do have to tilt down or tilt up in regards to how you're communicating, but you, you can't lose yourself either, can you, in a situation no, like that? No, you can't. And I think it's, it, you're right. It is something that people, even subconsciously, I think, um, do position themselves um, to a certain degree, depending on who, they're, who they are um, speaking to. And so, but I, I find that some people don't do it very well. I think it, it's actually yourself who obviously does have a gift for it. It, it is that. I think it is... It's, uh, it shows a level of intelligence that some people, I think, don't necessarily have. Like, they, they don't change themselves enough if they are, say, either meeting the Queen or, um, or meeting a chimney sweep. So, and I think um, people who do it well, it, it, it goes a long way in life. I mean, it, you can apply it to anything. It, it can, you can use it to your advantage as you do either in a professional or on a personal level. So, mm. Absolutely. Alice, it's just interesting on that note, good point there, Marty, is... And I'm sure a lot of your Aussie audience would love to know this. How different is your Australian stand-up show, because you've got the tour coming up, to your London stand-up show? Is it massively different? Do you have to fine-tune a couple of sort of jargon words or can you just translate it straight across? You can get away with more in the UK than you can in Australia. More what? More range. You can talk about darker things more quickly. You don't necessarily have to apologise as much at the beginning of the show. They're less worried about feeling now, Does threatened. darker things mean less PC? Does it mean a gallows humour take on stuff? So, for example, I will make jokes about uh, all sorts of things. I have a one-liner that is um, uh, women in the audience, straight women, look into the eyes of the man you love most in the world and really viscerally understand that if you are ever the victim of a violent crime, he is statistically most likely to be the perpetrator. (laughs) It's funny because it's true. (laughs) And so I could say that quite early in a set in the UK and they would laugh and they'd get it. In in Australia, I would have to give a a shallower on-ramp Wow. You make them make them feel more comfortable, make them like me more so that they don't recoil. Why do you think that is? I think Australians are a little more conservative. Um mm-hmm. and and <laughs> they don't have quite the same taste for being turned upside down. Yep. But more we, we wouldn't uh, then I you'd almost I'm guessing American audi- audience would be even less so than Australia. Yes. Although yeah. American audiences, uh, they're not stupid, but they like it when you come down hard on your punchlines and yep. where you sort of, bah, you have to deliver a joke with more... This, ah. is, the, <laughs> yeah. this is it. Yeah. The sledgehammer. Because I think they're yours. more polite. They, they don't want to laugh if you don't want them to laugh. Yep. <laughs> your material, both your comedy and your podcast and your writing, it's very disturbingly frank. I love it because, like you said, it, it sums it up and hits it on the head and you talk from loss to love to you know all kinds of things with this beautiful laced humor um i imagine yes in the uk that goes down a treat when you are performing much like you said the uh, the the one-liner about <laughs> the, the marital abuse when you do perform that in australia what do you flesh it up with beforehand or so i'll do it at the end of a series of other one-liners and I'll deliver it in a sort of a more, as though I'm surprised at what I'm saying. I'll perform the shock that they are feeling. Okay. So that they know that that was sort of part of it. Um, so I'll react in my face to the way that I've delivered the joke. Okay. So essentially you, you might use the same set, but you just might chop it up and, and present it in a different um, chronological order. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I do comedy because I want to say what I want to say. Mm. I don't want other people telling me what to say. Yeah. Mm. But equally, you want people to be able to hear it. So then that's just a matter of how you serve it up, how you deliver it, or how much you chop it up and hide it in the vegetables, that kind of... When you talk about that with doing comedy and wanting to say something through the comedy, do you ever feel there's a danger that your audience over time will simply just become people who already believe in what you're saying? Like they are already fans of your ideology or your beliefs and so it'll just align that way. Or do you feel that comedy audiences are more than big enough around the world that you're always going to get a large chunk of the, the, the one who've never seen you before, who will be fresh to your ideas? Well, I think that's a really interesting question because a, a couple of things. Firstly, I'm not interested in preaching to the converted. Yep. I'm not interested in being that kind of 
political comedian and there are many who do it incredibly well where they're saying what the audience wants to hear and the audience goes, no, oh, that's what I thought, but you said it's smarter. And then, you know, just a mirror where you get to look good for yourself. But I think that I don't do that and I know that my audience won't, will always be uncomfortable with what I'm saying because I'm often uncomfortable with what I'm saying, even if they are exactly ideologically aligned with me, I'm always questioning my own beliefs and my own uh, certainties. Yep. That's what's interesting to me. And obviously I am, you know, in the arts, so I'm sort of in the left uh, group. There's a lot of comedians who are left and they will take a pot shot at the right wing mm -hmm. that they know their audience is going to agree with them on. Yep. I'm, they are doing that very well. I don't think I can do that better than them. So I'm interested in figuring out w what we're doing wrong, what I'm doing wrong. There seems to be in Australia sort of two comedy circuits. There is quite a cerebral, an arts one. It's kind of linked in with the improv scene and the, the various festivals and that kind of thing. Mm. And yet there's also another tradition of stand-up in Australia, which is the Rodney Rood kind of pub, outback, RSL one. Yeah. Do those two traditions of Australian stand-up ever merge? Or do you ever get booked from... I don't mean to be patronising any way, but does Toowoomba RSL ever give you a call and say, hey, Two weeks ago, I was at the Blacktown Workers Club. How was that? Uh, brutal. Um, <laughs> 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 but uh, for a very particular reason. So the thing about the Australian comedy scene is that it's really too small to make a living in unless you're willing to play any room and yep. unless you're capable of playing any room. And you have to do that differently. You know, you have to be able to adapt your act or do different jokes or, you know, suit them particularly in a club spot, you're there to serve them. Yeah. In your solo show, they're there to see you. And if they don't like it, well, too bad. Uh, but uh, the, work, the Blacktown Club I did, uh, I wanted to run my gala set for the Melbourne International Comedy Festival. It's a four-minute television set. So I had that very strictly in my mind, what I was going to say. And I'd been watching a bunch of gala sets on YouTube and I, re I noticed that they all open with like, oh, I'm so happy to be here, how great it is. And so I thought, I won't do any of that. I'll just open with one-liners for the gala. I'll just come straight up to the mic and just hit them with five jokes in a row and then relax a little and do a longer form joke. That was the wrong choice for that room that night. I'd come after three not to be thingy about it, but white men in their 40s off the television and a ventriloquist uh, who just finished a, a cruise. And I was the only woman on the bill and a lot younger. And what I should have done was crowd work. I should have just introduced myself and made them feel comfortable and made them feel important. But I had in my head that I wanted to run my gala set and it was <laughs> the wrong choice. Do you well, feel, you just mentioned about obviously being a female comedian in a, in a long line of uh, males, maybe particularly in Australia, often there's that feeling of like, oh, and she's a woman, oh, well done. Like you've already won part of the way because they go, oh, good, aren't you brave? But at the oh, same no, time, it's even harder because they go, now be funny. Yeah. You're brave, now be funny. Do yeah, I, I don't think you get the, you're brave. You oh, get really? the, why, what, what are you? <laughs> what is this? <laughs> Who tricked really? me? Wow. Yeah, well, all jokes are a trick, right? They're a trick that is being played on you. People don't like having tricks played on them by people that they feel superior to. <gasps> yeah, that's not a bad point. I, um, I, I also think it's interesting that you said how you basically, before you go out there, you're, you might have the set you want to do, but I didn't give much thought to the idea that the comedian prior to the show is really coming out with a game plan specifically suited for that audience. They yeah. might have all this material, I think this is my A material, but if they're going to, you know, they're, go they're going to work essentially, they're going to go and do their job here, here or here, well, they're just going to basically have to change everything up to suit that audience rather than it be, as you rightly pointed out, that I'll just do my material and I hope, geez, I hope I get a good crowd tonight. It's more, I need to make sure that this crowd responds to what I've got to say. Yeah, you'll often have a kind of a water tester joke that's a kind of you know how well that joke does on a scale of one to ten mm. and it's your you know it's your regular eight and if you drop it into the room you can tell what kind of a crowd it is so it's a say it's a safe joke but there's a bit of edge to it and you you can tell from their laughter if they're more uncomfortable or if they're completely delighted with it and then you steer from there it's a little bit more okay. smart move yeah adjusting on the fly most comedians will have a joke like that where they 
they can test the audience with that joke because they know that joke very well. That lets you read the room. Yeah. And then it's a pick a path from there. Yeah. Anyway, Alice, yeah. on that note, do you want to just tell us where you're touring over the next month? Yes, I am in Melbourne for one more week at the Melbourne International Comedy Festival at the Town Hall. Then I will be in Perth from the 9th to the 11th of May. And then I'll be in Sydney from the 16th to the 19th of May. Then after that, London and Edinburgh. Excellent. And do you have a website where people can sort of follow you and yes, you know, Alice, maybe download your podcast yeah, and everything Oh, else? yes. I have so many podcasts. Um, AliceFraser.com is my website. That's your kind of central point for everything that I do. Excellent. Well, thanks very much for being on the show tonight, Alice. Thank you for having Great me. Having it's been you a too. delight.